Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this month's BNTP series. Today we have Dr. Fran Wise presenting on cardiac rehabilitation and secondary prevention of coronary heart disease. A reminder to all connections to please mute and block the cameras. We'll have time for questions at the end of the session. Should you not wish to announce your question, feel free to type it into the chat pane at the bottom and I will announce your question at the end. I'll now hand it over to Dr. Fran Wise. Thanks, Terence, and thanks everyone um, who's listening in. Um, today, I'm talking to you for a couple of hours, which sounds horrendous, but this talk actually breaks down into four parts. So what we might do as we go along, if, um, if people need a break after each section, we can take one or two minutes. I might need to grab a cup of tea myself, and um, it may not actually take the two hours so we'll see how we go. So um, as Sarah said, I'm going to be mainly talking about cardiac rehab. And as uh, part of what we do in cardiac rehab is secondary prevention of coronary artery disease. So what I'll be uh, presenting to you is a bit of information, a few statistics about cardiac disease in Australia. Now, um, you will have uh, access to handouts based on the slides today. So. Uh, please don't feel overwhelmed by all the stats I'm presenting, but they, they are fairly interesting. And when I was preparing this talk, I was thinking if I were a registrar going through exams, um, what are the sorts of things I'd like to be able to answer? And one of them might be, you know, how prevalent is cardiac and particularly coronary artery disease in Australia? So that's why I thought a few stats might be useful. Then the next section will be talking about actually how you do cardiac rehab. How do you provide it to um, patients that actual nuts and bolts and logistics. Then uh, I'd like to spend uh, a few minutes talking about the outcomes and the benefits of cardiac rehab um, as, as we find in the medical literature. And finally, um, a little bit of time on how we prevent further problems in coronary artery disease, particularly by trying to modify risk factors. So they're the four segments we'll be covering today. All right, so let's talk about a few stats uh, regarding coronary artery disease in Australia. And these are derived from the Australian Bureau of Statistics and the Australian Institute for Health and Welfare. So these are probably, uh, although they seem a couple of years old, these are probably the most up-to-date stats we have on prevalence and uh, so forth. So we know that 3% of Australians have a long-term coronary artery disease condition. So that's just uh, uh, coming up to 600,000 Australians. And as you would expect, uh, that's more prevalent in men compared with women and certainly in the older age group. So if you compare people over 75 to those in sort of a, a middle age group, um, it, you're looking at prevalence being about nine times higher. Uh, in terms of how many strains ever have a heart attack, it's estimated it's a bit over 400,000. And in terms of in a typical year, in the most recent year, how many people end up in hospital with coronary heart disease, uh, it's about 150,000, where coronary heart disease is the principal diagnosis. And that compares with, say, heart failure and cardiomyopathy. That's uh, just under 70,000 hospitalizations where heart failure is the primary diagnosis. Now, as you would expect, um, with, uh, along with other health conditions, um, people in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population um, fare worse than non-Indigenous Australians. So, for example, um, the ATSI population is 70% more likely to die from circulatory diseases. And in terms of being hospitalised with ischemic heart disease, it's twice as high in Indigenous men and three times higher for Indigenous females compared to the non-Indigenous population. If we look at deaths from coronary heart disease in Australia, it's certainly the single leading cause of death in Australia, with just under 20,000 um, deaths in 2015, which works out as an average of one Australian dying every 27 minutes from CHD. 
and when you actually look at w w what percent of deaths is accounted for by CHD, it's about 12%, again, being higher in men than women. And uh, this just illustrates, uh, going back to 2013, but again, this is probably the most up-to-date info we've got on this at the moment. If you compare coronary heart disease to other leading causes of deaths in Australians, you can see, particularly for men, it's certainly way uh, ahead compared with dementia, stroke, um, lung cancer and, and COPD. For women, um, the differences aren't as marked, but it's certainly still number one. If you consider coronary heart disease compared with other cardiovascular diseases, again, you can see it's still way out in front compared with things like stroke, heart failure um, and other vascular diseases. A question that we're often asked in coronary um, or cardiac rehab is if a person's had a um, heart attack, what is the risk of them having another one or dying in the next 12 months? And there are statistics available on this and it's uh, broken down depending on whether a person has sustained a STEMI or non-STEMI. And uh, you can see they're, they're not insignificant statistics whereby, for example, a person having suffered a STEMI, 10% of those people um, will die by 12 months post-event. Now, despite that all sounding very gloomy, we know that ca uh, cardiovascular diseases deaths have actually fallen dramatically since the 1960s. Uh, at that stage, those sorts of diseases, would each, which would include stroke and a heart attack, would account for about 60,000 deaths annually, compared with, as you saw before, um, we're talking less than 20,000 nowadays. Uh, it particularly dropped by nearly 40% between 1985 and 2015, so that 30 year period. And much of that decline is because we are better at preventing these diseases in the first place, detecting them and managing them in the, in the early stages. This is a graph that just illustrates that decline. You can see it peaked around 1970 for both men and women, or perhaps more for men, I, I should say. And, uh, Thankfully, it's been declining ever since again, particularly in the, in the male group. This is an interesting slide. This just compares um, the causes of death in Australians by different diagnoses. Now you can see ischemic heart disease is still out in front, but you can see that that uh, line it has been dropping, the purple line has been dropping over the last 10 years or so, compared with things like dementia, which is actually creeping up slightly. Um, and other diseases like lung cancers, which are, are pretty well flat. So yes, there are fewer deaths resulting from ischemic heart disease, but it is still killing more Australians than other diagnoses. So if less or fewer people are dying from uh, ischemic heart disease or coronary heart disease, the corollary is that more people are surviving. And it is interesting to compare what happens nowadays compared with say 20 years or so ago, where nearly two thirds of people who have a heart attack survive compared with less than half in 1994. But what we have observed is since 2007, that survival rate seems to have been plateauing. Now, the survival rate has been improving over those years because again, we're probably uh, diagnosing people with milder forms of coronary events. So they get put into the pool and obviously their survival is better. Um, and this picture just shows you how survival has been improving since 1994, but plateauing over the last um, 10 years or so. So more people are surviving, but that doesn't mean we don't have a significant burden from coronary heart disease. Uh, about 10 years ago, and obviously these numbers would probably be more now, uh, it's costing billions of dollars in health costs in Australia for coronary heart disease. About three quarters of that is the hospital costs for treating people with coronary heart disease. We also know that people with heart disease are less active and that will impact on their work productivity. And 
people with heart disease also consume considerable amounts of medication um, and that accounts for, again, billions of dollars to pay for that treatment. Now, as I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, we know that coronary heart disease can impact on people's level and function. Now, that can be due to lost time at work because you're in hospital getting treated, etc. But I, I guess a more concerning statistic is the fact that people survive their heart attack, but then a significant number of them will then go on to develop heart failure within the next six years or so and develop associated uh, impairment and disability with that diagnosis. Um, just under half of the women with a heart attack and about uh, a fifth of men will go on to develop heart failure in those years. Let's uh, look at a few stats on heart failure then. Um, if you look at adults in Australia, the prevalence is about well, a bit over 100,000 people. And in a year, about 68, 69,000 people are being hospitalised with heart failure. And we do know that it's the number one uh, reason for people to be admitted into hospital in the over 65s. And certainly age and heart failure are, are correlated such that two thirds of people, of adults with heart failure are actually aged over 65. And in terms of how many deaths it's causing per year, it's uh, about four and a half thousand. Okay, so they're the stats. Hopefully that wasn't too uh, overwhelming or boring, but uh, as I say, I think particularly keeping in mind exams and so forth, a few helpful stats on the prevalence of those conditions is, is not a bad thing to have in your mind. Now, the next thing I ask myself is, well, you might be asked in an exam, well, how do you actually do cardiac rehab? What are the processes? How do you prescribe exercise, et cetera, et cetera? So what I'd like to go through now is a little bit about how we do cardiac rehab. Now, um, with cardiac rehab units, most of them uh, through Victoria and the rest of Australia would only be staffed by uh, nurses and physiotherapists. But there are a few, including the one I work at, that where a rehab physician would be involved. So it's useful to be aware of what is involved in delivering a cardiac rehab service. So to, first of all, we need to define what cardiac rehab is. Now, the World Health Organization has a definition, which is worth looking at, but it's very wordy. I apologize. It's a sum of activities required to influence favorably the underlying cause of cardiovascular disease. So I guess they're talking about secondary prevention, as well as providing the best physical, mental and social conditions so that patients can basically preserve or resume optimal functioning and improve their health behavior and slow or reverse progression of disease. So that certainly covers it. But as I say, that's a very wordy definition. I guess in point form, we're really looking at a cardiac rehab is a systematic supervised program that involves customized exercise. So while patients are often exercising in a group setting, the exercise they're doing is individually prescribed. There's an education component to cardiac rehab. And the aims are really to help people recover from the cardiac event, adopt and adhere to their healthy lifestyle habits that may or may not be new to them address comorbid issues that might be impacting on their recovery, monitor for their safety, particularly during exercise, and help them and encourage them to adhere to evidence-based medical treatment that they may be on. And that is often through an education program that we help with that. Um, obviously in Australia being uh, multicultural, we need to be aware of meeting individual and cultural needs of our patients, whether that's through the use of interpreters or translated written materials, or, um, just to uh, make sure that people have access to the information that they need. So the goals are basically helping people regain their strength, fitness and function, preventing their condition from getting worse, and reducing the risk of further cardiac events. So that's in a nutshell, the sorts of goals that we're aiming for broadly. 
next question is if that uh, if that's basically what you're hoping to do who should you be doing it to and as you can imagine we're really open to a wide range of cardiac diagnoses um, myocardial infarction coronary artery disease without infarction um, people who have had stents with or without infarction prior to that heart failure or cardiomyopathy stable angina valve replacements bypass grafts transplants uh, this can vary for example at Caulfield Hospital where I work we don't often uh, have people post transplant coming through the program because the Alfred Hospital who is which is the acute hospital we get most of our patients from have their own post transplant rehab program arrhythmias and people who don't necessarily have developed uh, coronary artery disease but do have a history of the risk factors and would benefit from addressing those. Now one of the questions is uh, is there an age limit on who should come through cardiac rehab? Now cardiac rehab is targeted at adults so we would typically take people over 18 but the question is is there an upper limit and basically there's not. In a study of 80 year olds in Canada for example going through cardiac rehab um, a third of them were able to increase their exercise time uh, oh sorry they had a 33 percent increase in exercise time they improved their exercise capacity by 20 percent they improved their good cholesterol levels and it was found to be safe in terms of uh, adverse events or deaths so yes the qu answer to that question is no people are not too old for cardiac rehab uh, this is some data from our own program that shows that if you look at the dark blue bars, which represent people over 65, their improvement in um, exercising for at least 150 minutes per week, which is the typical goal we encourage in our patients, was really well achieved by that older age group from admission to discharge and maintained at follow-up, which is performed at three and 12 months post-discharge. And it is you know favorably comparable to the younger age group too so we do see the improvements in our older patients just as much as in our younger now despite all all of our open doors we don't always get the people that should be coming to cardiac rehab the latest uh, research on this in Australia shows that less than half of people who should come to cardiac rehab are actually being referred and on top of that, um, a patient may be referred but may choose not to attend. So what are the causes for these sorts of things? Well, in terms of the referral, down at the bottom, you see poor understanding of cardiac rehab by clinicians. Um, and it is very much dependent on uh, referring cardiac units or cardiologists being aware of cardiac rehab and the benefits of cardiac rehab. Um, and being supportive of referring their patients to them. There are cardiologists who feel that it's not necessary, that the patients can resume their own exercise and other um, lifestyle habits without going through a program, which is disappointing. In terms of the patient's barriers, it could be because of uh, language difficulties or cultural differences. Often um, transportation is difficult, either because patients are elderly and don't drive, or, or can't drive, for example, after cardiac surgery, or it's because they live in more remote or regional areas where it's difficult to get to a cardiac rehab program. Often patients who are of working age um, will elect to return to work or feel they have family obligations that prevent them devoting the time to attending a cardiac rehab program. And uh, this is particularly noticeable in those who perhaps, uh, for example, have just had a stent um, and feel relatively okay but have had no input in terms of secondary prevention and unfortunately that group often doesn't make it to cardiac rehab. So how is cardiac rehab delivered? Well the traditional way and the way we do it at the hospital in which I work is the facility-based services where a patient will come to a centre and carry out their cardiac rehab there. But there are other uh, variations that have been developed over the last few years. Home-based services are becoming more av uh, available for those where it would be difficult for them to attend a, a centre. 
There are telephone based services, perhaps the most um, well known of these is something called the coach program which isn't strictly cardiac rehab but it's certainly aimed at helping people with secondary prevention of cardiac disease so uh, the health professional will ring the patient um, on say a weekly basis check in how they're going sticking to their um, health habits medications weighing themselves um, exercise and so forth and, and help continue motivating the patient to keep on track with those sorts of things. And more recently, um, apps and internet services have cropped up as well. So for an example of an internet cardiac rehab program, Heart Online has been developed in the last couple of years. And this gives uh, both health professionals and patients a lot of information that they can access online. So it's more like, uh, I guess, a... Um, a, an information source, um, but it's it's certainly worth checking out in terms of from even a health professional point of view. It has a lot of valuable information. For apps such as My Heart My Life from the National Heart Foundation is a more interactive program that uh, people can use. Now, again, these things have lots of valuable information. And so for people who really can't attend a cardiac rehab program, they're a reasonable option to think about. The only thing I would be saying about these options, and this includes the telephone services as well, you don't obviously get the peer support that is present in attending um, a cardiac rehab program where you're going through the program with um, people who, like yourself, have had some sort of cardiac event. And I don't think that sort of thing should be underestimated. People uh, going through a program, seeing that Others have had similar experiences. They're not the only one. They can exchange experiences and stories and tips and so forth. That actually does a lot to help people in their recovery. So what I'll be talking about uh, for the rest of how to do cardiac rehab is really, I guess, focused on the facility-based idea of cardiac rehab. So the components would be an initial evaluation, um, physical activity, which I'll talk about what that comp comprises in a minute, lifestyle education, and psychosocial support. So in terms of the in initial assessment or evaluation, which is carried out typically either by um, the nurse and or doctor plus physio, we assess uh, a person's current medical status and limitations to participation in exercise. Um, review of their symptoms and wounds because obviously uh, participating in cardiac rehab requires a patient to be medically stable. Um, if they've gone through surgery, we want to also make sure that their wounds are healing well. A psychosocial history, including a work history, is really important, um, particularly if you've got people of working age that will require some sort of assistance with a return to work plan. Um, obviously, we need to know what their work history is and how they've been managing with that. Then there are some just uh, general physical measurements, height, weight, blood pressure. Uh, we would also want to assess a person's exercise capacity or fitness. This is typically done with a six-minute walk. Um, medication review. And then because psychological... Uh, Wellness is certainly an important factor when it comes to heart disease and its prevention and recovery. Uh, often checking some sort of mental health questionnaire is useful too. Cardiac depression scale is one option that was specifically designed for cardiac patients, but others can be useful as well. For example, in at Caulfield, we use the hospital anxiety and depression scale. Um, but there obviously are, are tons around that you can choose from. And other questionnaires would be of use too. Quality of life questionnaires like the SF36 are useful. And in this population too, being aware of other associated uh, comorbidities such as sleep apnea are worth thinking about. For example, we've reasonably recently been measuring uh, symptoms of sleep apnea at Caulfield with the use of the Berlin questionnaire. Um, and that's been quite useful. 
just by by way of what we've been picking up, you might be aware that in the general population, obstructive sleep apnea occurs in about 25% of men and 9% of women. And what we're finding in our population, it's about 38% of our patients are coming up positive for sleep apnea. Now, less positively is uh, what happens next because once we've identified people with uh, risk of sleep apnea, we've been alerting the patient and also in writing their GP requesting that person gets referred on for further investigation or sleep studies. And out of 160 so patients that, that applied to, only about five were followed up um, as requested. So we have to rethink our approach to that, but it's certainly uh, another important comorbidity that you can think about investigating for your cardiac patients. Obviously, we need to explain to the patients what the program's about. When patients are being initially assessed, again, because secondary prevention is such a big part of cardiac rehab, you need to be aware of what their risk factor profile is. And this includes both modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors, as you see here. Um, as, as I mentioned before, we explain what the program is, is about and often at this initial stage and during their uh, stay with us over the six weeks or so that they'd be attending, we also provide them with written materials that might assist them in their knowledge of their heart disease, whether it's coronary artery disease, um, which is in that My Heart, My Life, the booklet on the left, or Heart failure. These are both publications from the Heart Foundation and they're excellent. And then also making people familiar with uh, action plans. Now, the action plan there applies to coronary artery disease. There are also action plans for people with chronic heart failure, and it's basically teaching people um, when do you call an ambulance, what do you do when you've got chest pain, um, and really giving them information about how, how to manage those situations. Because obviously, if you've been through something like a heart attack or operations or whatever, people's anxiety and uh, lack of confidence about the whole issue is, is quite um, marked often when they start their cardiac rehab. Okay, now as I mentioned, one of the things we do when we assess people is assessing their physical ability or fitness or exercise capacity. Now, if you're consulting uh, literature or textbooks from overseas, for example, United States, you may notice when they're talking about cardiac rehab, patients there are initially assessed with treadmill tests using the Bruce protocol, for example. Um, and that was something that was used occasionally in selected units here in Australia, gosh, about 20, 25 years ago. But really, it's not something that we now have resources or staff to do. So our fitness assessments are a lot lower key, but they are still effective and um, it still assists, assists the physios in particular with exercise prescription. Now, this slide is showing an incremental bike assessment. Um, so people are on a stationary bike and every two minutes, their intensity um, as measured in kilopon meters per minute is increased. And along the way, they are having their heart rate tested and their blood pressure. And when they finish, when they've gone as, as far as they can or to the maximum here of 60, 600 kilopon meters per minute, their, uh, their lungs are listened to, their respiratory rate is checked, their, their rating of perceived exertion is also measured. And then we also check these things at two minutes post to see how well they recover. Um, it sounds like a basic test, but actually from bike assessments, you can uh, convert their efforts into METs, which is often quite useful. And as I say, it's a, a good measure for physios then to use for exercise prescription and knowing how quickly a, a 
um, patient is recovering after a set intensity of exercise. And this is just our physio doing such a test. So as you see, it looks, it looks pretty straightforward, but it does give us good information. It's a, also a test that we can repeat on discharge and compare how patients have improved over time. With the bike assessment, what you're looking for um, is either that endpoint that I mentioned or if any of these things develop, such as angina, dyspnea, fatigue, um, blood pressure changes, um, pulse going up too high, etc. And these are all signs that that test should be um, stopped. All right, so having assessed the patient, they will then start attending a cardiac rehab program. Typically at our program, they're attending two or three times a week. Some programs can only offer once a week, depending on their uh, staffing resources. But it's typically cardiac rehab program would run over six weeks for coronary artery disease patients and maybe eight weeks or more for those with heart failure because they are exercising at a lower intensity and take a longer time to actually recover. So as I mentioned before, the components will include exercise and education program and support. The physical activity, the advantage in cardiac rehab is they're doing it in a safe supervised setting. And that actually does add to real safety in terms of exercise, but also helps patients become uh, more confident. Again, when patients have experienced a heart attack or other cardiac event, they are often very anxious about resuming exercise because they're afraid of, well, what if I have another heart attack? How do I know how much exercise to do? And the fact that they're being supervised at all times where they're exercising cardiac rehab is a big bonus. We're usually doing both aerobic and uh, endurance activities as well as strength training. And because the, pers the exercise is individually prescribed, it means that each patient is working at an appropriate level and we start from where they are. It doesn't matter if they've been totally sedentary before or really fit because we're individually prescribing their exercise. It's always going to be appropriate. So how is exercise prescribed? Well, as I mentioned before, if you're in, a, in the US or other countries that do fancy things like treadmill testing with Bruce protocols, you would then base your prescription on the result of that sort of testing. However, because that is not something routinely done in Australia, we have to do uh, other calculations that are perhaps a little uh, less refined, but still helpful and still safe and uh, still useful in, in getting people exercising at an appropriate level. So we use the uh, maximal heart rate as being 220 minus a person's age, which as I say, sounds like a very blunt measure, but it is a useful starting point. So in coronary artery patients, having worked out that maximal heart rate, you then aim to work them at 60 to 75% of that heart rate, um, which would represent a moderate level of exercise. If you're on beta blockers and obviously a little bit more bradycardic, you need to adjust for that. So they may be typically working at 50 or 60% of their maximal heart rate. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is monitoring of their exercise effort or intensity. And here we use the Borg scale of perceived exertion, which I'll go through in a minute. If a person has exertional angina and it's stable, obviously we, we don't want them doing much if they're unstable, but if it's a stable and predictable angina, the heart rate target would be 10 beats below the heart rate at which they start to get angina. Um, now, as I say, we do exercise in a supervised setting, but what does that supervision actually entail? Every day when a patient arrives, we're checking their pulse, we are interviewing them regarding how fatigued they were after their previous attendance. For example, if a patient went through their exercise but had to lie down for two days, it may be that we need to pull back on what they're doing. Uh, any cardiac problems, shortness of breath, chest pain, palpitations since the previous attendance, any signs of fluid overload, um, whether that's ankle swelling, shortness of breath, sudden increase in weight. And blood pressure may be checked as required. 
So the idea behind progressing people through their exercise, because obviously the aim in cardiac rehab is to increase people, uh, people's exercise levels as they improve, is first of all, you target duration, then you target frequency of exercise, and lastly, the intensity of exercise. And while they're exercising, you are attending to the Borg rating, for example, respiratory rate, really important, heart rate, and also any symptoms that they might be developing, like shortness of breath, sweatiness, um, dizziness, etc. So just to re-emphasize, your first priority is increasing duration of exercise, how many minutes that they can exercise at one go, then how many times that they would exercise per day or per week. And lastly, the last thing you actually start to change is intensity, how hard they're going. So talking about duration, how much is enough? Well, this does depend a little bit on what your goal is. To improve fitness, 30 minutes per day is recommended. And this is sort of our generic recommendation to, to patients coming through cardiac rehab. We advise them that they can break this down into smaller units of 10 or 15 minutes, but not less than 10 minutes at a, at a time. If the aim is for weight loss, um, 30 minutes may not be quite enough and you may be looking closer to 45 minutes. If you want maximal cardiovascular protection, 60 minutes per day or more is actually optimal. But I think the main message is that the optimal duration of exercise uh, over and above any 30 minutes is what the patient will actually maintain. There's no point encouraging someone to do an hour of exercise a day when that is psychologically or physically or timetable wise just beyond them and the whole thing falls apart. Pedometers are another way to uh, encourage and monitor people in their daily exercise. Um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the concept behind pedometers by now, but they have certainly a lot of advantages. They're affordable, they're simple for patients to understand, um, and they're also immediately understandable to health professionals checking on how they're going. Most people in their usual activities get up to about 3,000 steps, but as you probably are aware, 10,000 steps is the thing that often people are targeting. And that is actually something that developed in Japan in 1965. Um, it's also noted that people who are walking at least 10,000 or more steps a day are more likely to be doing it in bouts of more than 10 minutes, which again is optimal. These are just pictures from our unit. Okay, let's talk about the Borg uh, rating of perceived exertion. And uh, you, again, I'm assuming no previous knowledge, though I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the Borg scale. It ranges from six to 20 uh, in terms of how hard or easy a person feels that they're working during their exercise. So for um, coronary artery disease patients in in green, we'd be asking them to aim somewhere between 11 and 13 on this scale, working fairly light to somewhat hard. And people do tend to understand those ideas, even though it might seem a little bit imprecise. And that level of uh, moderate exercise equates to about 60% of VO2 max. With heart failure, as I mentioned before, they are usually starting at a lower level. And so their intensity or perceived exertion is usually around nine to 11, so very light to fairly light. The other way that patients can be taught to monitor their, how hard they're working, the intensity of their exercise, is using the talk test. So again, comparing this with the Borg scale where aerobic exercise in cardiac and coronary artery disease patients would be around 11 to 13. If they're able to sing while they're walking or on the bike or whatever, they're probably wor working at around seven to nine on the bulk scale. It's a bit too easy. If they're able to talk but not sing, that's about right. That would put them in that moderate exercise level of 11 to 13. If they're puffing and panting and cannot talk, that's too hard and they need to pull back. So teaching patients about these ways of monitoring the intensity of their exercise 
uh, just to, uh, into assist them in terms of how hard they should be working and what is safe for them. Heart rate monitors or polar monitors are another way that we monitor um, patients' exertion. Um, these were huge a few years ago with our patients and don't seem to be as popular now. Um, so I'm not quite sure why, but they are still obviously available. And uh, I guess the cartoon says it all. So whilst we teach patients um, about monitoring uh, using the Borg scale or to the talk test. There are also signs of overexercise that both staff and patients need to be aware of, whether it's chest pain, shortness of breath, a heart rate that's greater than the target heart rate, depending on their age, etc. Um, if they're not returning to baseline pulse and blood pressure levels by about two minutes or so post uh, cessation of exercise, if they are starting to feel cold and clammy, if they're feeling tired or weak in the next day or so after exercise, if they're feeling dizzy or unwell or nauseated. These are all signs that they may be working too hard and need to pull back on the intensity of their exercise. Now, as I mentioned earlier, as well as the aerobic component, we also uh, give strength training as part of the cardiac rehab program. Uh, with the aims of reducing body fat and increasing lean muscle mass, which in turn will help with cardiac fitness and also weight control. Strength training is typically uh, done to target numerous uh, muscle groups. So in our program, we're doing eight different types of exercises. Uh, patients are typically doing eight to 12 reps per set and one to three sets per session. And we advise them to do a couple of times per week. So how do you prescribe resistance exercise in cardiac rehab? Uh, initially, you are checking what a one RM, and that's the maximum weight a patient can do once. You then work out how many kilos that was and aim for about 30% of that weight. Uh, the alternative way is just to work out what is the weight that they can easily lift eight to 10 times. As I mentioned, two or three times a week is uh, felt to be sufficient for resistance exercising. And typically when the patient in, engages in resistance exercise during a cardiac rehab session, they'll do one or two sets with a rest period of a couple of minutes between sets. Um, so with those eight different types of exercises, the whole session might take about 25, 30 minutes. And you can see here, we're doing one exercise per major muscle group, both upper and lower uh, body muscles. How do you progress people doing resistance exercise? Well, uh, again, it's the same principles as with the aerobic exercise, the last thing you're going to do is increase the weights. The first things you are doing is increasing the number of reps up to about 15. You go up to the maximum number of sets being three. And when a patient is exercising at those maximum levels, then you can start increasing the weight. And typically you go up by 5% each time. Again, using the Borg scale to monitor will help you work out how the patient is progressing and whether they're working at the right level. How does this compare with aerobic exercise? Well, again, just a reminder, aerobic exercise is around 11 to 13 in a cardiac patient. Strength training, they can push themselves a little bit harder around 13 to 15. Excuse me, I'm going to cough. <coughs> okay. So, um, resistance exercise is not for everyone. You would not uh, get people started into um, serious resistance exercise until two or three weeks post their infarct. And certainly if they've had a sternotomy following bypass grafts or valve surgery, you would need to wait a few more weeks after that. Unsta <coughs> Excuse me, unstable angina, decompensated heart failure, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of these uh, contraindications would really be for people to not be attending cardiac rehab at all. Acute myocarditis, 
um, severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, <coughs> uncontrolled blood pressure, aortic dissection. I mean, these are pretty obvious. Um, recent embolism and severe pulmonary hypertension, as well as obstructive cardiomyopathy. Okay, another exercise modality um, we offer and some other cardiac rehab units would offer is Tai Chi. And obviously, it's a lot gentler than some of the other exercises patients are doing, but it is useful in lowering blood pressure and heart rate, improving quality of life, reducing stress, which in itself is an important uh, modification of risk factors, improving flexibility and balance, muscle tone, is also improved. So some combination of cardiac and non-cardiac benefits. Excuse me, I'm just going to have a sip of water. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, hydrotherapy. Now, hydrotherapy is not a routine part of cardiac rehab, but often patients are asking, well, when can I do uh, exercise in a pool or return to swimming? And the, the basic overall rule would be you'd have to wait at least six weeks following either your surgery or your infarct. If you've had a transplant, that's, uh, you can double that time. But there are still precautions or contraindications to hydrotherapy. Um, aneurysms, whether they're ventricular AL or aortic. Um, heart failure, you need to be quite cautious of, especially left ventricular failure. Uh, the risk of pulmonary edema goes up if the patients are in cold water. And obviously, any extremes of temperature is not going to be great for the heart, and that includes saunas. There are, are absolute contraindications, including uncontrolled arrhythmias, third-degree heart block, unstable angina, and decompensated heart failure. But again, these are fairly obvious that perhaps a patient shouldn't be exercising at all on, on land or in water. As I mentioned uh, at the start, cardiac rehab is both the supervised exercise, but also education. So the sorts of topics that we wouldn't typically go through is teaching a person how to manage their chest pain, and that involves uh, being familiar with action plans, for example, their medications, principles of exercise, understanding their heart disease, what caused it, what are risk factors are all about, uh, nutrition, relaxation, stress management, risk factor management, as I mentioned. Um, uh, what I'd like to do is look at a couple of the components of some of those lectures that perhaps you wouldn't necessarily be as familiar with. Um, for example, lifestyle management by a social worker would perhaps uh, look at more psychosocial issues. Uh, for example, being ready to change lifestyle psychologically what helps a person achieve those changes, stages of change, being willing to change? Um, how do you get motivated to change your behaviours? How do you make it work? How do you maintain changes in your lifestyle, whether that's introducing a new exercise routine or a new eating pattern? So that sort of um, change management lecture can be useful. Dietitians are obviously a key part of cardiac rehab. Um, so the sorts of topics they would typically look at is management of cholesterol and triglycerides, uh, education around saturated fats and trans fats, salt intake, reading food labels, a really important one. Um, what is a healthy weight? How do you aim for it? How do you maintain it? The use of antioxidants, alcohol consumption, uh, fiber in the diet, and how do you modify your diet, your recipes, your eating out, to make sure that it's uh, optimally healthy for your heart. Psychosocial support is the fourth component of cardiac rehab that I mentioned. And uh, this is really important. It's as well as just having general uh, peer support and support from the staff, encouragement, etc. there are some more pragmatic ways that we support people going through cardiac rehab. For example, a patient who is of working age needs to get back to work, particularly if it's a more physically demanding kind of work. An occupational therapist can assess their work. Uh, they do a task assessment of what's involved in the, their job and help them develop a greater return to work plan. Uh, the OT can also be involved in liaising with the employer, submitting a written plan um, 
and it's very similar to return to work plans that you might see OTs involved in other uh, diagnostic areas in rehab. Smoking cessation is another important thing. Nurses often have specific training in the QUIT program and are able to give patients one-on-one -on -one attention to support them through this. Dietitian counselling, again, we're giving them uh, group-based education, but sometimes individually tailored information is often useful. And uh, then there's other sorts of counselling that might be useful. This isn't necessarily available with all programs. Sometimes uh, patients have to be referred out or via their GPs, for example, to see a psychologist if stress management or depression or anxiety are particular issues because they themselves are risk factors that should be managed. And diabetic education uh, is, is done as required. Again, most programs will not necessarily have a diabetic educator on staff, but referral to one within the hospital or in the community may be required. Afterwards, what happens? Having gone through a six week program with us two to three times a week, um, patient is assessed at the end of the program with measurements and outcomes similar to what they went through on admission. And then they're provided by the physiotherapist with a home exercise program, including written information about what their target heart rate should be. They're also given advice about their exercise options. For example, if they are interested in uh, gym programs to help them maintain their weight training, for example, advice is usually given about community gyms and our physios will often um, be sources of information for gym staff to know how to work with these patients and progress them. Um, uh, optimally, a program should also be reviewing patients post-discharge. Typically uh, at our program, we're following people at three and 12 months post-discharge to see how they're progressing. Uh, are they maintaining their exercise routine? How's their weight going? Are they in, uh, encountering any problems with sustaining their lifestyle changes? And uh, as I mentioned before, cardiac rehab is an advantage of having a lot of peer support and patients often feel the benefit of that on a long-term basis. So attached to a cardiac rehab program, there may be a cardiac support group that is actually run by ex-patients. Sometimes they, their uh, focus is uh, fundraising for the unit, or it might be that they get together with invited speakers to help continue their education process and continue to offer each other support. Okay, does uh, everyone need a little bit of a break? We're coming up to 10 to four. Um, so we are probably about halfway through. Would people benefit from a, a, a minute or two, do you think, Terence? Hello? Yeah. What I might suggest is we'll just take a couple of minutes break and uh, then we'll get going with looking at some outcomes from cardiac rehab. All right, um, let's move on to the next section. Um, having gone through what cardiac rehab entails, let's look at some of the benefits um, based on what, what's in the published literature. We know that patients following cardiac rehab will improve their capacity to exercise, whether that's measured in terms of their METs, um, metabolic equivalents, that can increase by about, uh, uh, around a third. Uh, peak VO2 can increase by 15% and the anaerobic threshold can increase by just over 10%. Now, other things that we aim to do with cardiac rehab patients um, in terms of secondary prevention, if there is a problem with overweight or obesity, we'd like to address that. But I must say that the worldwide, the um, benefits of cardiac rehab in helping patients achieve this is modest. So for example, body mass index over a six week or so period would only go down less than 2%. Percent body fat would go down about 5%, although metabolic syndrome, but that's um, entailing other 
factors like blood pressure and cholesterol does improve to a greater degree. Um, this is sort of our ongoing problem in our unit and other problems. How do we help patients achieve a better and sustainable weight loss? And it's something we're still working on. Whether we need a more psychologically uh, driven approach to weight loss um, or uh, yes, it's, I'm not quite sure because people get a lot of information, both individually and in a group setting, and uh, yet we make not as much impact on people's weight as we would like. In terms of the impact on cholesterol through cardiac rehab, uh, this is a bit more positive, and it's particularly noticeable in terms of patients' triglyceride levels. And this is something we've seen in our own patients and our program, as well as in the published literature. Triglycerides can uh, reduce by up to about 15%. It's a more modest improvement in HDL cholesterol and total cholesterol, and uh, an even smaller improvement in LDL cholesterol. So exercise is not uh, exercise and cardiac rehab is not the sole uh, answer to improving a, a lipid profile, but it can help. Other benefits that have been seen in published literature include reduction in inflammation, and this would be uh, separate, obviously, to any benefits you would see in weight loss, because we're not really changing people's weight, but we can improve inflammatory markers. Behavioural characteristics do improve, and again, uh, from our own experience and that in published literature, there is certainly improvement in people's levels of um, depression and anxiety through the involvement in cardiac rehab. Um, and then there are some more specialised, I guess, measurements that we certainly don't do, like autonomic tone, rheology, homocysteine levels, but these are all felt to improve through cardiac rehab. Quality of life um, is also something that's improved through the engagement in cardiac rehab. Again, this is something we've seen in our own patients as well as in published literature. And the other thing that is seen is then when a person comes through cardiac rehab, hopefully because their uh, ability to engage in secondary prevention techniques, their ongoing hospitalisation costs can be reduced. And finally, overall morbidity and mortality has been observed uh, following a cardiac rehab program, and particularly uh, those problems associated with psychological distress and depression. Now, what about the safety of cardiac rehab? Um, obviously, patients are often anxious about engaging in exercise following a cardiac event. How, how are we able to reassure them? Or are we able to reassure them cardiac rehab is safe? Well, in fact, it, it is. Um, in multiple studies, uh, the fatalities following exercise hours in cardiac rehab is about one per hundred, 800,000. Now that figure that's there was based on that earlier paper in 1986, but even more recently in 2013, a similar paper showed uh, very similar numbers in terms of fatality rates, exercise in people with coronary artery disease in cardiac rehab. With heart failure patients where you would feel there's possibly more concern about safety in cardiac rehab. In fact, it's also been found to be safe. And these were Australian figures where there were no deaths directly rated, related to exercise in heart failure patients um, in over 80,000 patient hours. And in our population, that would be supported. Um, we've had certainly um, very safe record over 25 years or more with our coronary artery disease patients and in over 5,000 exercise hours in our heart failure patients, we've only had one patient who was transferred to the acute setting because of low blood pressure and uh, we've certainly had no deaths. Okay, what I'd like to then spend a few minutes on is talking about the specific benefits of exercise. Again, thinking about the exam situation where you might be asked, well, what are the benefits you would expect in exercise in heart uh, cardiac patients? Um, 
Before we talk about that though, let's talk about why not exercising is not a good thing. I just really like this slide of catching an escalator up to do exercise, but that's um, just my quirky sense of humour, I guess. Okay, let's look at how well Australians are exercising. Um, the average is about a half an hour a day doing physical activity. So that's not necessarily dedicated exercise. That might be including walking to the bus or activity around the home or whatever. And we know that 60% of adults do less than 30 minutes a day. Um, and a small amount, less than 20% are doing more than an hour on average of exercise. In terms of sedentary leisure, how many hours are we spending a day? On average, it's about four hours. And about 30% of Australian adults are spending more than five hours of sedentary leisure each day. So when you think about you get up, you have your breakfast, go to work, get home, there are probably only about five hours before you go to bed. And so there's quite a few people who are just spending that whole time in sedentary pursuits. And this graph is just showing uh, the, the amount of hours being spent by different percentages of the population. And you can see the largest bar is where people are spending zero to half an hour. And that's, uh, again, nearly 40% of the population spending that much time in physical activity each day. All right, why are we sedentary? Well, cars is one thing. If you compare how we were in 1950 and how we are now in terms of car ownership, you can see there's um, about a tenfold increase in car ownership in Australia. The other thing that keeps people sedentary is how they entertain themselves in their own home. Nearly every home has a television um, and most homes have an average of 2.8 televisions per home. So that's uh, nearly two, three TVs in a home, quite a lot. And games consoles in family households, 77%. So lots of reasons to be sitting and uh, watching a screen. Obviously, the other important screen we have nowadays are computers. And when we look at internet access, which makes, I guess, computer use more enjoyable, um, the, if you look at all the households in Australia, internet access is in about 86%. But if you have children under 15, that number goes well over 95%. So all of these technologies are really encouraging us to not move very much at all. However, the idea of being sedentary being a problem is not a new problem. It's not only since technologies, but in fact identified by Hippocrates in ancient Greek, where he said all parts of the body which have a function, if used in moderation and exercise in labours in which it's accustomed, become healthy, well developed and age slowly. But if you don't use it, basically, they all get diseased, don't grow properly and age quickly. So what are the uh, consequences of sedentary lifestyle? Because we've established, yes, we are sedentary, but what does that mean in terms of our health outcomes? When you look at sedentary lifestyle in research, it's often talking about 20 minutes a day or less, less than three days a week. Now, just keep in mind in cardiac rehab, we're encouraging people to exercise 30 minutes a day, five days a week. So if people do adhere to the cardiac rehab message, hopefully they don't fall into this sedentary uh, category. But we do know that people who do meet the definition of sedentary lifestyle are at highest risk of all cause and cardiovascular mortality. Why is physical inactivity such a problem? Because it is linked to uh, suppression of lipoprotein lipase activity. It is linked to development of metabolic syndrome, obviously weight gain and excess body fat and risk of type two diabetes. Um, for example, for every hour you sit in front of the TV, if you're a woman, there's a 26% increase in prevalence in metabolic syndrome, which is um, pretty startling. Here's a neat graph that I actually show the patients uh, in our lectures. And it basically shows that if you become less fit and more inactive, it's, a, it's an exponential rise in your mortality risk if you're moving to the left. 
This is another graph that's quite interesting and just showing some of the risks of inactivity uh, put in different ways and it's quite interesting. Graph A just shows comparing drivers and conductors on things like trams and trains and so forth. Obviously drivers are sitting a lot of the time, conductors are moving around and their risk of myocardial infarction, you can see the difference there. In terms of daily sitting time, graph B, you're looking at mortality and fatal infarcts. And as sitting time goes up from black to red, your risk of those things occurring also goes up significantly. Graph C is basically showing uh, non-exercise physical activity. So this is uh, incidental exercise and just showing um, the benefits of that. So encouraging patients to not only just do their uh, exercise walk, but just generally keeping more active and less sitting around can have a positive benefit on mortality. Um, and similarly, in the uh, older age group, in the last graph, you can see the effects of physical activity. Why is exercise therefore so good in terms of your heart? Um, this is a graph, I won't go through it in detail because you'll be getting this in your handout, but you can see it has a range of benefits, both physical and psychological, uh, ranging from direct impact on uh, risk factors for atherosclerosis, as well as impact on um, thrombotic activity and the coronary arteries themselves and arrhythmias. This is also showing a combination of physical activity and a healthy diet and what it does to various um, factors, I guess, lipid profile, inflammation, etc. That impact, therefore, on risk factors such as diabetes, hypertension, and therefore coronary artery disease, leading to a reduction in myocardial infarction and stroke. All right, we know that physical activity is linked directly to other risk factors itself. Um, and just a, a few to remember, because this is also useful for patient education to really remind them of the things that they can be doing to modify risk factors over and above medications they may be receiving for blood pressure, cholesterol, etc. So for example, regular activity will reduce systolic blood pressure by up to 20 millimetres of mercury. Um, and that's not going overboard with exercise, just three or four days a week of walking can help. Um, and it's also observed that uh, there's an associated improvement in endothelial function. And further, if you combine physical activity with a healthy diet, you're also reducing problems with um, insulin resistance and oxidation. Metabolic syndrome can also be positively affected by regular physical activity. And again, metabolic syndrome is not an inconsiderable problem in Australians in terms of the number affected, but we can reduce the prevalence by about a third with regular physical activity. Diabetes will certainly be increased in more sedentary patients such that those with low fitness are over three times more likely to develop diabetes. But with regular physical activity, you can actually see a reduction in need for medication. And this was in a study that was controlled where the controls actually increased their need for medication as opposed to nearly three quarters of exercising patients where their medication needs reduced. And uh, we know that physical activity improves insulin sensitivity in muscles in particular. Now, exercise on several days of a week is obviously helpful, but the actual intensity at which patients exercise is also useful, assuming that that's at the right level. Um, and as you see, as you increase your VO2 max, um, more factors uh, positively affected, but I would draw your attention to the fact that it seems around 60 to 65% of VO2 max seems to be the optimum in terms of the factors that get positively affected. Above that, you're not really adding extra benefit. So um, it's that little 
sweet spot in the middle that you're aiming for in terms of exercise intensity because beyond that you're not adding benefit and you are increasing the risk of injury as uh, illustrated in this little picture that basically shows moderate exercise that they saying three times a week 20 minutes we'd say 30 minutes five days a week um, would give you maximum benefit beyond that you're raising the risk of injury below that you're probably not doing much in the way of benefits on your um, heart and risk factors now in terms of the sorts of exercises you might want to recommend to patients here are some activities that all have similar health benefits whether it's swimming laps cycling pushing a pusher if they happen to have a pusher plus minus baby um, walking three k's in 30 minutes wheeling self in a wheelchair washing and waxing a car washing windows or floors now i've highlighted the walking as something that's uh, generally pleasurable uh, although some people find it quite boring it doesn't require special equipment i would certainly prefer it to washing and waxing a car and uh, it gives similar benefits to those other activities. Now, in terms of benefits of exercise by diagnosis, um, it doesn't take a long time to build up a good improvement in exercise capacity in the setting of different cardiac diagnoses. So for example, if you do regular exercise, after three to six months, your aerobic capacity following a heart attack can improve by over half similarly with bypass grafts angina and heart failure you can also all uh, observe significant improvements in capacity in the setting of these quite significant diagnoses the specific benefits of exercise training include the fact that exercise capacity and we've just seen that you can increase that by over 50 percent it's a powerful predictor of mortality more so than other risk factors for cardiovascular disease such that for every met increase in exercise capacity there's a 12 percent increased survival in men and 17 percent increased survival in women so those messages are certainly worth um, conveying to patients in terms of why exercise even not in the setting of cardiac disease, but certainly where cardiac disease exists, why exercise is a, a positive thing to do. Now, in terms of strength training, that also has benefits to be observed, uh, not only in cardiac disease, but in these other conditions, including arthritis, osteoporosis, obesity, back pain and depression. But in terms of uh, cardiac uh, benefits we know that there's an improvement in capillary density myoglobin concentration the body's potential to store glycogen maximal flow rate through blood all of blood vessels I should say all of these things just come about through strength training so certainly a lot of benefits above just feeling stronger now what are the risks of all these exercises I mentioned the benefits but there's always got to be a risk does there not and uh, yes if you look at joggers um, there's one death per 7,000 joggers or if you look at jogging hours uh, one death in about 400,000 hours um, so if you looked at death rate in people who are jogging versus people who are sedentary doing sedentary activities you're more likely to die jogging than doing something sedentary um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't be jogging or doing some sort of exercise the risk though in cardiac patients is uh, you have a hundred times risk in uh, having a cardiac event if you're performing an vigorous exercise and by this we're talking about jogging or running that sort of level compared with if you are looking at spontaneous cardiac events not associated with vigorous exercise so it, it does happen however it's important to also recognize that the risk of uh, adverse events or death from exercise it's much greater if people are normally sedentary and then start to suddenly exercise vigorously as opposed to people who are doing regular moderate exercise building up their fitness gradually so for example um, the risk uh, 
in sedentary people who then suddenly decide to do a vigorous exercise, the risk is 56 times. Um, if they're a person who habitually exercises and then does vigorous exercise, uh, the risk is much smaller. So I guess the take home message is exercising at a higher intensity isn't necessarily a bad thing, but you need to train up for it. Okay, um, this is the last section. So we, I think we're going okay for time. Just want to touch on a few aspects of secondary prevention of coronary heart disease. And this, in, this in, uh, envelops a lot of the stuff we go through with our patients in cardiac rehab. First of all, I just want to go through the medications that will, people will be placed on following a cardiac event to aid with secondary prevention. Basically, they'll all be on some sort of antiplatelet agent, um, typically aspirin, which will the patient will be advised is li lifelong. Um, if they're intolerant of aspirin, they can use clopidogrel as well. And often they're using the two things in combination with the clopidogrel going on for 12 months and then the aspirin lifelong. And this is particularly in the setting of stents or fibrinolysis, or if they've had uh, a, an event or significant coronary artery disease that has to be medically managed because, for example, a stent couldn't be placed. Um, so often dual therapy. Now, some patients need anticoagulation and it's really, uh, for example, in patients following an infarct who are at risk of thromboembolism because they're in atrial fibrillation, they have a mural thrombus or they have a previous history of embolism. ACE inhibitors are pretty well prescribed for everyone with coronary heart disease and certainly also very um, prevalent in patient, patients with uh, heart failure as well. It is started soon after a, an infarct, for example. Obviously, some patients are intolerant of ACE inhibitors, for example, with the development of a dry cough. And so angiotensin II receptor antagonist serotonin alternative. And with any of these medications, monitoring of renal function is obviously going to be important too. Beta blockers are also prescribed as part of secondary prevention. And again, you would routinely look at prescribing these post-infarct, particularly if there's been significant necrosis or um, left ventricular systolic dysfunction or persistent ischemia or history of ventricular arrhythmia. And again, following an infarct, stents, etc., everyone would be prescribed some sort of short-acting nitrate like anginine or a nitrolingual spray. Um, and they also should be provided with a written action plan for how to use those and how to manage them about the expiry uh, date on medications once you've opened the bottle, for example. The fact that if you get chest pain, you would take uh, a spray or half an anginine uh, and then repeat that in five minutes, but really any chest pain persisting for 15 minutes or more, they should be calling triple O. So that's the sort of action plan you would educate patients on. Now let's just move on to some of the risk factors that we educate patients in terms of managing. Now there's a very short list of non-modifiable risk factors and uh, they are non-modifiable for uh, obvious reasons, but a longer list of things that we encourage patients to try and work on. So these are, this is just a very busy slide showing how all these things fit together to lead to cardiac disease and uh, related death if these things are not addressed. Cardiac rehab, uh, cardiac risk factors have been extremely uh, well studied in literature over the last five, ten years, and you can just see particularly blood pressure and diabetes are favourites, but all of them, you're talking about tens of thousands of articles uh, or studies that can uh, examine the role of these factors in heart disease. This is just a graph, uh, I won't dwell on it too long, it just shows uh, death and disease burden as it relates to different risk factors, um, not just cardiac but other factors. But you can see if you look at uh, the top graph, high blood pressure, smoking, cholesterol are way up there compared with things like unsafe sex, uh, alcohol use, air pollution, etc. So they do have an important role in terms of death and disease burden. <laughs> 
Okay, so what are our goals for risk factors? It's uh, probably convenient to consider risk factors in terms of health factors and health behaviours. So the health factors are measurable things like cholesterol, um, blood pressure, smoking and glucose. Uh, with the cholesterol, that's 5.2 millimoles per litre untreated. You will find though that once a patient has uh, cardiac disease, the total cholesterol goal is around four or less millimoles. Health behaviours, uh, as you can imagine, are things like uh, the weight, physical activity and what's in your diet in terms of sugar, fat, salt, um, fish providing omega-3 fatty acids, for example. This graph then combines those two groups of factors, health factors on the side uh, axis and health behaviours along the front and what it's showing is um, the more factors come together the greater your incidence of heart disease. Let's just take each factor uh, one by one and a few interesting facts about each. Hypertension accounts for 60% of strokes and nearly half of all coronary heart disease and in most developed countries, over 80% of patients of adults are at risk from their blood pressure. Uh, the importance of that is that for every 10% increase in hypertension treatment, i.e. getting things under control, you can prevent quite a lot of deaths from coronary artery and other associated diseases. So uh, I'll just skip through this because this, I guess this is fairly basic knowledge about the definition of hypertension. Um, but I just wanted to flag the importance of trying to make sure that the blood pressure measurements are reflecting real life. Often white coat hypertension is an issue. And so trying to get accurate measurements, whether that's, you know, they're fine when their GP measures them or they've got a machine at home that, uh, that they know how to use might give you a truer picture of where the blood pressure is. So where, where do we go with blood pressure treatment? Um, the National Heart Foundation re recommends ACE inhibitors as first line treatment um, using angiotensin II uh, antagonists as an alternative. And keeping in mind if these medications are being taken and the blood pressure is not really well controlled, consider whether there's a compliance issue. Now, above and beyond medication, though, the importance of secondary prevention in cardiac rehab is to encourage patients to manage their risk factors using lifestyle interventions. And so, for example, with blood pressure, um, you can make uh, significant improvements in systolic blood pressure measurements through uh, reducing weight, salt intake, increasing physical activity, modifying your diet so it's much less unprocessed foods, sorry, much more unprocessed foods, and limiting alcohol intake. And you can see on the right side what sort of improvement in systolic blood pressure can be achieved through these lifestyle measures. This is a, a graph that basically just shows if you were to reduce um, salt, uh, what sort of benefits would you see in blood pressure? And you can see the darker line, the hypertension, hypertensive patients show a much more dramatic change. So I guess the message here is the worse your blood pressure, the more you've got to gain by getting your salt intake under control. This is just something that shows the association between salt and coronary heart disease death. Um, it's, I guess it's fairly self-explanatory comparing higher and lower salt intake. But it goes for all deaths, not just coronary heart artery deaths, which is interesting. So this little uh, table, what this is showing is what are the benefits of reducing your salt intake? And there are basically three sections. If you reduced your salt intake by three grams a day, six grams a day, or nine grams a day. And the figures of interest are obviously over in the right, where if you reduced your salt intake by nine grams a day, you can reduce your risk of ischemic heart disease death by nearly uh, or certainly around a quarter and saving quite a few lives. This is obviously a British study and being linked obviously with a drop in your both systolic and diastolic blood pressures.
Well, what are the levels that we should be advising patients in terms of their salt intake? The average Australian is taking in about 12 to 15 grams a day of salt. We are genetically programmed, as in caveman times, of about a quarter of a gram of salt a day is perfectly, we can survive perfectly well on that level. Um, we don't expect people to get down to that level. Uh, we, I guess the recommendation currently is if you could halve that 12 to 15 grams, so reduce your salt intake by about six grams, you're halving it, that would give you significant health benefits. And uh, it should be noted because patients might feel that if they're used to a salty taste, will they not enjoy their food anymore? But a reduction of 10 to 25% in salt intake can't be detected by taste. The problem though is not so much that patients are adding a heap of salt at the table, but they're eating processed foods and that's where the salt is coming from. 75% of our salt intake in fact is from processed food, uh, including things that don't even taste salty like cereal and bread. Now the meat and poultry I'll explain in a minute. It's not uh, lean meat, fresh meat, it's processed meat is where the salt is lurking. And in fact, processed meat has four times the amount of sodium compared with just unprocessed fresh red meat. And this is a, quite a startling statistic, I think. Just two slices of that sort of meat, whether it's you know, normal ham or smoked salmon or salami, things like that, you can increase your risk of coronary artery disease by over 40%, which um, patients are quite startled to hear when I tell them. This illustrates, and I don't think any of these meals look entirely appetizing, but this just illustrates the difference between cooking from scratch and buying a similar meal uh, ready-made or manufactured. And you can see the salt uh, differences in, in these foods if patients are making things themselves because they're using unprocessed foods basically, as opposed to what might be coming in a packet. So, because salt intake in Australia is often associated with packaged foods, we need to educate our patients about food label reading and what the differences are in reduced salt, no added salt, low in salt. I'm just keeping a little bit of an eye on the time, so I'm not going to go through in detail reading out this slide. I think you can refer to it later. And this is just showing the importance of food labels, educating patients how to use it, the 100 gram column, looking for sodium, not the word salt, and what that means. For example, a low salt food being less than 120 milligrams of sodium per 100 grams, and that is the sort of food, if you need to eat a packaged food, that's where you're aiming. Now, cholesterol is obviously another significant risk factor that we need to educate patients on, not only because of its cardiovascular risk, because also of its associated risk of future dementia. Um, I think the research is fairly clear that uh, blood cholesterols, are, if elevated, are associated with an increased risk of atherosclerosis and cardiovascular uh, events. And certainly the recommendation currently in most guidelines would be to recommend lifestyle and dietary changes for all patients to try and improve their lipid profile. How much intervention patients need will depend on their total cardiovascular risk. Now, just a bit of an historical uh, note. Um, part of the problem is, yes, blood cholesterol is an issue, but I think over the last 40 years or 50 years, there's been too much of an emphasis on dietary fat and dietary cholesterol as a problem causing um, cardiovascular diseases. And this really uh, stemmed from this guy, Ansel Keys, an American um, physiologist who really pushed the low fat message uh, to the exclusion of any other health advice. And uh, whilst, yes, healthy eating, looking at your um, monosaturated fats, a high fibre diet and exercise can help, I think the low fat message has been pushed so hard to the detriment of people's health because it has resulted in an increase in refined carbohydrates, which in fact has contributed to elevated cholesterol as well. And this is uh, 
personified by this guy, John Yadkin, who was pretty well a contemporary of Ansel Keys. His thesis was that sugar is actually the problem with heart disease. Um, but because Ansel Keys was so influ influential in the scientific community, he discredited this poor guy who's now dead um, and saying that's absolutely rubbish. Dietary fat is where it's at. You've got to be low fat, la, la, la. And uh, so the whole um, problem with sugar and its, pro its danger to us has been overlooked until fairly recently. This is why uh, sugar has been felt to be a problem in terms of cholesterol. Um, fructose being one half of the sucrose molecule is metabolized only by the liver and the byproduct of that is VLDL, uh, cholesterol, which is directly linked to development of atherosclerosis. There are other very nasty byproducts of fructose metabolism, such as increases in uric acid and so forth. But the link between sugar and cholesterol and therefore heart disease, I think has been underestimated until recently. So because the message has been so much low fat diet for the last 40 years or so, patients you might find get very hung up on, yes, low fat, if I just cut out the fat, I'll be fine. And this is a useful uh, bit of information to keep in mind how useful are low fat diets and this a uh, couple of studies i'd like to just go through with you to illustrate the fact that they're not all they are uh, cracked up to be this is a study of women that went over eight years in the 90s and as you can see it's nearly 50,000 women in, involved so a decent sample size where they were randomly allocated to either a low fat diet or just eat whatever you like and the low fat group were very conscientious, they reduced their fat consumption considerably. But uh, I wonder if anyone can guess what the difference in their weight was at the end of that eight years. Um, obviously, I can't hear what you might be guessing, but in fact, the difference was 0.4 of a kilo. And there was certainly no difference in rates of heart disease, stroke, breast cancer or bowel cancer risk. So low fat diet, not so effective. The PREDIMED trial is a more recent study, and that's, again, showing low-fat diets aren't always necessarily the way to go. I'm not adv uh, um, advocating, you know, just have a, a diet jam-packed with heaps of saturated fat and fried foods, but what I am saying is patients should be aware that there are other issues in diet besides your fat content. So this study, again, decent sample size, 7,000 people, uh, either allocated to a low fat diet or a Mediterranean diet. The low fat diet, we're told you can eat a bit of pasta and potatoes, some so starch, refined carbs, don't use too much oil and low fat dairy. The Mediterranean diet, nuts, eggs, oily fish, <coughs> excuse me, olive oil, you can have a bit of wine, a bit of dark chocolate. You don't have to count calories. Now, both were encouraged to eat more fruit and veg and cut down on sugary snacks. So in terms of how did the low-fat group compare, the Mediterranean diet group were 30% less likely to die from a heart attack or stroke. They cut their risk of diabetes by 50%, where the low-fat group did not. And uh, women on the Mediterranean diet were able to reduce their risk of breast cancer with the use of supplementing extra virgin olive oil. The low-fat diet had no effect on breast cancer risk and less decline in cognitive function and dementia was noted on the Mediterranean diet too. This is consistent with other more recent diets that have been developed like the MIND diet, which is specifically developed to help prevent dementia and they have a lot in common being very uh, rich in unprocessed foods uh, fruit, a little bit of fruit, but vegetables, a few nuts, uh, fish or a little bit of poultry and not too much processed food or red meat. So what are the National Heart Foundation recommendations on dietary fat? Well, again, they're really um, going down the line of unprocessed food, uh, lean meat and poultry, uh, legumes, nuts and seeds. They do say reduce the, the, the fat in your dairy. Um, and look at healthy choices with your uh, fats like avocado oils, olive oils and so forth. And, and they're obviously promoting reduction in salt as well to help things along. 
They also, again, looking at what sort of fats should be in your diet, suggest reducing saturated fat and using more polyunsaturated, monosaturated fats uh, and some whole grains. And they have found the evidence associates that measure with lower risk of heart disease. Whereas if you just take the fat out of your diet and replace it with carbs, you're not doing yourself any favours. And obviously trans fats uh, in any form is not good as it increases cardiovascular risk. Now, if you go on the internet, it is fraught in terms of working out what are good fats, what are bad fats, are polyunsaturated okay, are monounsaturated okay. Um, and you get so much conflicting advice. It, it certainly does your head in. So I guess a good starting point is National Heart Foundation. But also keep in mind that um, not all oils, for example, are good. Um, in heart health, you are wanting to optimise your omega-3 fatty acids. And if you have too much omega-6 fatty acids in your diet, that will tend to suppress omega-3. So patients need to be educated about that in terms of choosing their oils wisely. Uh, these, this is a table you can refer to later about the recommendations from National Heart Foundation about the composition of your diet in terms of the different kinds of fats. This is just a little busy side showing if you had a lot of refined carbohydrates, which you can see on the left, leading to the things happening in the middle. If you then add oils that are high in omega-3, suppressing your omega-6, you will then end up with the diseases on the right. Okay, statins, uh, obviously widely used. Uh, it's a pretty more automatic once a patient is diagnosed with coronary artery disease, they will go on to a statin of some description because we know in addition to the effects they have on cholesterol levels, they will also stabilise plaque and they will also reduce the risk of dying in this population. But they have a positive impact on cholesterol levels, particularly LDL and triglycerides. They're recommended, with, as I say, for all patients with coronary heart disease, but in some patients they need to be stopped, particularly if there's the myalgia issue and a rise in creatinine kinase. Other lipid medications can be used. Usually estamibi is used in combination rather than a single agent. Um, and it's really, if you're on maximal cholesterol statin and you, your goals aren't being met, you might chuck in estimibi. Fibrates are usually useful um, where there's a presence of type 2 diabetes or high triglycerides or overweight. Um, and so that's lipidil or lopid, uh, your choices there as well. Now, triglycerides, uh, because they have... Uh, sugar, and they're a sugary molecule, they're going to be reduced by reducing not only fat, but sugar and alcohol in your diet, as well as losing weight and exercising. And they do benefit from the addition of fish oil in your diet, uh, including cold water fish, um, or the use of fish oil or krill oil supplements. Just a little um, caveat on the fish. Um, these are all excellent fish, but salmon in Australia is farmed and may not have exactly the same benefit as wild salmon because the wild salmon are producing omega-3 fatty acids through eating um, algae, whereas farmed fish are being given fish food. So you may not get exactly the same benefit. Um, this is just showing the benefit of using fish or fish oil capsules in terms of mortality, which is uh, pretty impressive. Obesity is the next, next risk factor. Sorry, I might be speeding up a little bit. I'm just keeping an eye on the clock for, for everyone. Um, just I'll skip to this slide, which basically shows the light blue column is Australia in terms of the league table of how obese we are. And the orange is the OECD average. So we're still way above the average, but I think we've actually slipped into fifth spot. The last uh, time this um, table was produced a few years ago, we were in fourth spot. So hopefully that means we're getting better rather than other countries getting worse. This just illustrates the fact that men are worse off in Australia in terms of overweight or obesity, and it's primarily because men, are, more men are overweight but not obese compared with uh, women, whereas the obesity, i.e. BMI over 30, is comparable in both sexes. 
um, and this just is a similar uh, slide showing adults in general and how our obesity levels are sneaking up whilst our overweight but not obese levels are sort of fairly flat. Um, another big slide, I won't go through this in detail, just showing the adverse effects of obesity. Um, and why are we obese? Well, when I ask patients this, they usually say, well, it's it's got to be a combination of uh, fat and not exercising and alcohol and uh, carbohydrates, too much sugar, etc. cetera. Um, and while all of those things may play a role, I think the outstanding thing in the last 40 years has been our sugar or fructose consumption, um, certainly in both adults and children. But why did it go up over the last 40 years or so? Um, and it's because guidelines like these were produced at the end of the 1970s, where at the um, under the influence of Ansel Keys again, the message was low fat, but you could increase your carbohydrates to 60% of your calories. Um, and dietary cholesterol had to come down, even though that meant people got really scared of things like eggs, which is such an excellent food. Um, and this just illustrates the point. You can see that blue line, the arrow points to where those dietary guidelines came in and they were adopted around the world. And that blue line started to go up, carbohydrate intake, everything else stayed sort of flattish. But that blue line going up, it corresponds to this line where BMI started to go up as well. And there are obviously other unattractive uh, effects of lots of fructose in the diet, including non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which used to be unknown and now is becoming more and more prevalent. Um, effects of sweetened beverages, um, showing that certainly in terms of the risk of heart disease is, is significantly increased by the ingestion of things like Coke. Now, we've worked out the fact that we are fatter and that's a bad thing. What would happen if you did lose weight? Well, your risk of type 2 diabetes reduces, uh, your metabolic syndrome obviously reduces, uh, your, your lipid profile will reduce, and this is over and above any medications patients will be taking. Um, what this is showing though is there is still fairly modest change in weight in cardiac rehab, unfortunately. Um, now, I just want to move on to some psychosocial risk factors um, because sometimes these are a little bit overlooked in terms of secondary prevention of heart disease. And these are some of the things that are known to contribute to the risk of cardiac disease. Low socioeconomic status, lack of social support, stress, hostility, depression, anxiety, etc. So, uh, Certainly low socioeconomic status is a known factor, whether it's you living in a, a poor area, low education level, low status job, low income. Those sorts of things have been known as independent predictors of mortality in heart patients. So it's not insignificant. Now, obviously, that's not something you can change in cardiac rehab, but it's something to be aware of. What can be perhaps addressed on a more individual level are things like depression and anxiety. And we know that the risk of heart disease is directly related to the severity of depression, the number of um, depression symptoms you have, which determines whether you're diagnosed as major or minor depression, can either double or triple your risk. And we also know that patients with depression have an increased risk of dying as well. Anxiety uh, is actually uh, now more recognised as well as a factor contributing to the risk of heart disease. This was a big Scandinavian study that showed that uh, anxiety did predict heart disease and heart attacks. And uh, in another study, uh, those with generalised anxiety disorder, 74% more likely to have heart attacks. But the interesting thing here is it doesn't happen immediately. Uh, in another meta-analysis, it found that anxiety at time A may not show up 
in terms of cardiac disease until 11 years later. So the problem may be well and truly entrenched before the heart disease finally shows up. We also know that people who are anxious after an infarct will have an increased risk of recurrent myocardial ischemia, tachycardias and fibrillation. So I'm not going to go into huge detail about the treatment of these um, uh, conditions, depression and anxiety. I think that's sort of too big for this uh, forum, but um, information is obviously available everywhere about how, how to optimally manage these conditions. And I'll just draw your uh, um, attention if you do read the MJA. There's In this week, there was a guidelines about treating major depression that you might find useful. Okay, social isolation is a really interesting one and one you may not immediately think of, but it is known that lack of social support can triple your risk of heart disease. But what we're talking about is functional social support and that's the actual aid and encouragement you get from other people. It is not the number of people in your social network, which is structural social support. So it is really important to encourage people to be aware that they only need one person in their life providing the support um, rather than feeling pressured to get lots of Facebook friends or whatever. They just need one person giving that support to help inoculate them against the effects of social isolation on cardiac uh, disease and uh, immune, um, immune system health and other conditions. Now, this is uh, an interesting area of anger and heart disease. Um, there are mixed results, but we do know that if you're angry or hostile, your uh, reaction to stress will be exaggerated. And there is a link between anger and calcification of coronary artery plaque, which is not a good thing. And um, there is a link between higher risk of cardiovascular events and uh, irritation or impatience or anger. And as opposed to anxiety, where the, the delay between being anxious and having heart condition can be 11 years, it's much more proximal when you're angry. Um, and really, the, the peak risk is in the first hour or two of blowing your top in terms of developing a heart attack. Why, uh, why are these things linked to heart disease in the first place? Well, if you're looking at anxiety or anger, or anything that's causing chronic stress, um, what you're doing is revving up your sympathetic nervous system and your hypothalamus pituitary access. You're changing your behaviours and therefore your uh, reactivity to stresses becomes exaggerated. You get lots more release of cortisol into the system and that in itself causes uh, increased dep deposition of abdominal fat, um, which in turn will increase inflammation. There's also effects on endothelium and um, platelet activation. All of these things will obviously increase the risk of adverse cardiac events. Smoking cessation, again, I'll just briefly touch on this because I think everyone is well aware of the problems with smoking cessation in heart disease, but we do know that reducing it is a good thing. If you do have coronary artery disease and you stop smoking, you can cut your risk of mortality by over a third. How, did, how is it done? It's not easy, but brief, repeated, non-judgmental advice is uh, recommended. Referring patients to the quit line or if the cardiac rehab staff are uh, skilled in, in quit, the quit approach, that can be a good resource as well. But I just uh, alert you, there are cautions required with the use of nicotine replacement therapy in certain conditions, which I've listed there. And finally, alcohol. Alcohol is a bit of a mixed a risk factor in moderation, not necessarily a problem, but certainly in excess, it will cause uh, an increased risk of heart disease through increasing blood pressure, weight, triglycerides. And so the recommendation is to, for healthy patients not to be drinking more than two standard drinks a day. For women, if they're being treated for blood pressure, that's down to one. So educating patients around what a standard drink is, that is a drink with 10 grams of alcohol, which equates to 100 mils of wine, or a pot of full-strength beer, 370 mils of 
uh, light beer or a nip of, that's 30 mils of any spirits like vodka or gin, and then being aware of the re recommendations that is two of those a day, two days off a week, and if it's your birthday, no more than four drinks in an occasion so you don't actually injure yourself by being inebriated. So we're coming up to five o'clock. That's the end of the information I wanted to give you. So if there are any questions before we wind up, I'd be very happy to take those. Thanks.